Well, amen. Amen. It's good to be saved. Good to be in church on a Saturday night. Saturday night. Where did some of you used to spend your Saturday nights? Let's see. Well, yeah, that's what I want. That's what I want. Well, it is, uh, it is good to be saved. It is good to be here. Why don't you open your Bible to 1 Chronicles chapter 8. 1 <clears throat> Chronicles chapter 8. I'm preaching about the crucifixion, but I just thought nobody ever preached out of 1 Chronicles 8, so I'll pre- preach out of that. That's on. I'm sorry. I mean to wake you up. I saw him slumped over. I thought maybe. All right. 1 Chronicles chapter 8. This morning, Brother Calvin mentioned uh, Micah, the son of Mephibosheth. And tonight, I'm going to be talking to you about Mephibosheth. Let me tell you a couple of stories. Uh, uh, <clears throat> I was in Bible college with a guy. He was actually a couple of years ahead of me. Uh, he, had, he had gone to the Army when he got out of high school. And then um, uh, got out, became an electrician, you know, start, was, was doing that. Uh, and then went to Bible college. He was not called to preach. This guy's not called to preach, but he just went to Bible college. Uh, and so when he left there, he was an electrician. And you remember I told you about what you do in your 20s isn't what you necessarily do all your life? He changed course. And today, he is a successful plastic surgeon. Now you say, well, what an electrician. Well, 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 well. I, what, what you were when you were 20? Don't even matter. Doesn't even matter. It's what you make yourself after that. <clears throat> and here's the thing I'm thinking. Yeah, I knew him. He's a good man. But, you know, a guy doing, that's an electrician, who, would have, who, who could have known that he was going to be a doctor? Who could have known? Uh, there was another fellow, I remember, uh, years ago. Uh, and this was, uh, this guy and his wife, uh, they were going to go to Japan as missionaries. And this guy was, um, boy, he was just like that, that poster boy. You know, I mean, flowing blonde hair, big million dollar smile. Uh, he was a big strapping guy. His wife was about this tall. He's about this much taller than her. And, and they'd present their field of Japan. And, and she would stand back uh, at the door and everybody left. She'd say, the Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord bless thee and keep thee. And, uh, and he got up and presented the field of Japan. Well, he had it down. And they went out to Japan and did a great work. And, uh, and, and you could just see this, this guy's going to do something. And uh, went there and <clears throat> did this work at, uh, in Japan, came back at four years uh, for uh, furlough, and then decided not to go back, uh, and then uh, got a job in a store, and then uh, left his wife. You know where they found him? They found him in, a, in an old apartment in New York City tied to a chair with a bullet in his head. Uh, who'd have known? Who would have known? Let me tell you about a young man. This guy, I call him, I call guys like this Peck's bad boy. Okay? Just one of those guys that, that always seems to stand out for the wrong reasons. Where is he anyway? I don't even see him. Oh, yeah, there he is. <clears throat> anyway, so uh, a, a, a carrot top guy. He was a young man in my youth department. And uh, not bad, not bad but like ornery enough for about three of them. And uh, I always smiled. You hit him with a brick. And he'd, oh, yeah, that was nice. <laughs> Smile. And he got a job. Uh, actually, he got a job. He went, uh, he started a company. He was um, laying carpet. He got a carpet laying company. And always independent, good kid, really good kid. And who would have known that uh, somewhere right there toward the end of his 20s, he decided, I don't want to lay carpet anymore. Went to, bi- went to college, not Bible college. <clears throat> he went to college. And he's a doctor uh, in Texarkana, Texas. He's a, uh, a, a very, very successful podiatrist. When my wife had her eye problem, uh, he called me up. He has a plane. And he called me up and he said, he said, I will come and I will fly your wife any place in the country. He said, I'll, I will cancel my, my office hours and I will fly her any place in the country. And he's a good friend, great guy. Still got the carrot top, still, I mean, he is just, you just, this guy doesn't know what a bad day is. And if I told you some of the things he went through in his life, you couldn't have got through them. Some of you could not have gotten through what this young man went through. And, and I, you know, I see him. You know what I see? I see standing in the pulpit of my youth department. I see him back there. And if somebody would have said, doctor, 
Who could have known? Who, you know, you never know. You never know how the story is going to end. Uh, A failure. You know, we keep talking about losers. Can I tell you something? I have nothing against losers. I kind of like losers. Oh, I do. I do. It's the quitters I have no use for. You know what a loser is? That's somebody that tried. You know who the loser is? The loser is the guy that gets up with the, he gets in the ring with the heavyweight champion of the world, which none of us want to do. Goes 15 rounds, and when they're both just barely standing, and he loses in a split decision. And everybody goes, he's the loser. Loser, he can whip every other man in the arena but one. Yeah. Yeah. That's right, amen. It's the guys that, that you know, they, they got all of the jerseys, and they're sitting in the first three rows, and they, they're pseudo-boxers, yeah. you know. And they think they're champions. Yeah. And, uh, and, and those are the quitters. I don't like quitters. I really don't. I don't like people that don't get in. I'll take a loser. I'll take a loser, okay? And so all I'm saying is, uh, who would have known? And so I'm going to talk to you here in uh, First, First Chronicles <laughs> chapter 8. And we looked at this this morning. It says, the son of Jonathan was Meribael, Meribael, begat Micah. Now, Meribael is another name for Mephibosheth. So let's just bow our heads and let's talk to the Lord. Father, we thank you now, God, for your goodness. We thank you, God, for your grace. God, as we come to you tonight, uh, I want to say it. I believe these people agree we have no problem with you because there's nothing wrong with you. Never has been. We have no problem with your book. God, you know what we're saying tonight? In this, just being here, we are telling you We'd rather be here than any place else. We don't want to be any place else on the planet, God. We'd rather be in church, and it's all because of you. God, I hope, I hope there's somebody here tonight that just didn't feel like coming. I hope they came with a headache. I hope they came sick to their stomach. I hope they came mad about something in their life. And I hope there's somebody sitting here that just said, boy, for two cents, God, I wouldn't go, I wouldn't go to church. And they came. Bless those people who came when they didn't feel like coming when they weren't happy about it, when they didn't physically feel like being here. Bless them, God, for their attendance. I really ask you to. God, look this crowd over and look at where some of them used to be on a Saturday night and check out where they are tonight. That's got to put a smile on your face. Now, Lord, we're in this service and this is for you. And I ask you now, God, look, I know there's a message to be delivered here, but you've got to get Sam Gipp out of your way and out of the way of these people if they're going to get it. So please do that, Father, for their sakes. Please uh, get Sam Gipp out of your way and out of their way and and get your message across. God, accomplish your purpose in each life represented. In Jesus Christ's name we pray, amen. Amen. Now here's what I want you to notice about this. It says here, the son of Jonathan. Who was Jonathan? Who was Saul? He's king of Israel. So Jonathan is in line to be king. Correct? Correct? And then he has a son named Maribel. What's that mean? That boy, that boy is someday going to be king. Correct? Now, I want you to think about, what it, who, think about what it must be like to be five years old and you're going to be king someday. That's not bad considering King James became the king of Scotland when he was 13 months old. What did you give your 13-month-old? I mean, 13 months old, and he became the king of Scotland. Now, he wasn't aware of it, and it was, it was, reigned, uh, it was run by regents until he, he came of age and could take the throne. <clears throat> but, but here is this boy. You know what this kid is? All of his life, here he's Jonathan's son. By the way, I don't know what any of Saul's other sons were like. We know Jonathan was a good man, wasn't he? Yeah. Well, I'm telling you, brother, if he's around today, any, man, any preacher would take him as a church member. He was just a good man. No vanity, no treachery. You stop and think about this. When when Saul couldn't find David, and Jonathan said, go hide in the woods. And when Saul exposed to to, to Jonathan that he wanted David dead, it says Saul went in the woods and went right to him. Jonathan went right, I'm sorry, not Saul. Jonathan went right in the woods to him. Jonathan went right in the woods to where David was hiding. He knew exactly where David was. was. All he had to do was tell his old man, send a patrol right there, you got him, and my throne is assured. So here this, young, this man is destined to be king. And so here you got this five-year-old boy. He was destined to be king. 
Can you see? And I don't think the five-year-old kid had uh, dreams of grandeur. I can't wait till I wear a crown. I can't wait till I have a robe. He's probably thinking, I can't wait till recess, okay? (laughs) And so here he is, and he is destined to reign. Who could have known that at five years old he's going to run for his life? Who could have known when everything in his life was so blessed When all the other five-year-olds in the kingdom would say, boy, I wish I could be like him. I wish my future was his future. Who could have known that at five years old, he's going to run for his life? Guys, can you imagine what it must have been like all of a sudden? The the adults are all scurrying. They're all running. Things are being knocked over. People are crying. He sees women crying. He says, here's people saying, we've got to get out. We've got to get out. And somebody said, get the boy. And his nurse runs over and picks him up. And somewhere along the line, you know what he heard? His uncles are dead. They died in battle in Mount Gilboa. And he thought, oh no, my poor father, he lost his brothers. And he said, when's my dad coming home? And he found out his dad was dead. He thought, well, my grandfather saw it. He'll take care of me. And he found out his grandfather was dead. You imagine what the terror in a in a in a five year old boy. Now look, I'm not big on this trauma thing. I'm telling you, I just I'm just I've just had it. You know, well, I've just been traumatized. And, you know, I lost at marbles when I was six, and I just uh, I had to rob a liquor store. <laughs> I am so sick of everybody being a walking talking psycho. But I'm gonna tell you something, pal. If you were five years old, your grandfather died, your father died, your uncles died. You're carried out someplace and, and, uh, and, and your whole absolute life changes. And you are, you are running. Where did he sleep that night? Who could have known that he wasn't going to go to his bed? Who could have known that the usual nurse wasn't going to be there to read him a story and get him some hot milk? And, and maybe if he was a little bit scared, somebody would sit with him. And brother, that night he was scared. Who could have known? You know what he didn't know? He's going to live his life in terror. He didn't know if his uncle Ishbosheth was going to kill him. Because if he was Jonathan's son and John, he was Jonathan's son and Jonathan was destined for the throne, that means he's got more of a right to the throne than Ishbosheth does. And I got news for you, boy. One thing about them monarchy things, I hate to tell you this. You know what I think about blood, stick, and water? It don't work with monarchies. Buddy, those brothers killed each other. Them uncles, sisters, mothers, fathers. I mean, husbands, wives, they killed each other. They had each other killed. There was treachery in those ranks. I mean, brothers killed brothers. Uncles killed nephews. Nephews killed dads. I mean, it was crazy. So here he is. He's five years old. His father is dead. His two uncles are dead. His grandfather's dead. He is out running across the countryside. He didn't know if his... well, your Uncle Ishbosheth. Oh, not my Uncle Ishbosheth. He never did like me. How do I know he's going to kill me? How does he know David's not going to kill him? I mean, he's the one that's in the line, isn't he? Yeah. You got to eliminate the competition. Who could have known that this boy would run for his life at five years old? Who could have known? Who could have known he'd have spent his whole life as a cripple? And if this isn't bad enough, the nurse drops him. And his legs are never straight. This boy, oh, maybe it was one of those cases where had he been able to get medical help, those legs could have been saved. But he broke his legs. And they couldn't take him to any doctor because the doctor might turn him in. And so all of his life, he, he walked like this. Who could have known? You know, I mean, this kid, you, what do they say? Born with a silver spoon in your mouth? If it wasn't that, is that not Mephibosheth? Mephibosheth was, was born with a silver spoon in his mouth. Look at 2 Samuel chapter 4. And Jonathan, Saul's son, had a son. Verse 4, uh, 4, 4. Jonathan, Saul's son, had a son that was lame in his feet. He was five years old when the tidings came of Saul and Jonathan out of Jezreel. And his nurse took him and fled, and it came to pass, uh, as she made haste to flee, that he fell and became lame, and his name was Mephibosheth. Who could have known? Who could have known this kid that used to run and play in the palace? You think he didn't play in the palace? You think that he he didn't have a couple of five-year-old friends and they played hide-and-seek? 
Man, they got those hangings and those tapestries all around, and there's some kid darting here and darting there. And, and, and you know, look, I'm tired of being the Philistines. You be the Philistines this time. <laughs> and who'd have known this boy never walk right again? He would never walk. He would never be able to play again. Who could have known that he was going to be a cripple? You know, guys, um, things happen in your lives. Who could have known? I told you about that Kirby Campbell. That pastor, he passed in the church for 14 years, was doing a tremendous job. Who could have known going to, going, not for, he wasn't having a, a cervical fusion. They were using power tools next to his spinal cord. He wasn't a dangerous surgery, and it wasn't even the surgery that got him. He's going to have a, just a routine knee surgery, but the spinal got him. That guy can't, yeah, he just can't function like you and me anymore. Who could have known? Oh, he, he, if he could have known... I think he wouldn't have gone. What do you say? Yeah. You know, I, break, I broke my neck. And, and I'm telling you, God has told so many people why he broke my neck. But he never told me. I have people all the time, I know why God broke your neck. Well, well good. I'm glad he told you because he never told me. He really didn't. And, and, and everybody tells me all the great things have come from it. I'm just so happy about it. Can I tell you something? The morning I got up that I broke my neck, God tried to warn me. Believe it or not, I can remember to this day, the morning of that morning, I'm driving my boss's dump truck. We're hauling gravel to another foundation. Don't ask me why, but as I pulled up on the scales to be weighed coming out of a landfill, I looked, and there's one of those safety posters, and it said, beware of falls. Showed this guy falling like this. And it was like, and I'm telling you, say, how do you know God was warning me? Because I remember it to this day. I, I mean, I can, I can see it right now. I can, and, I, and you know what I... Do you know what I said? you know how I know it was God? I said, God, why do I have to be aware of falls? I'm driving a truck today. This guy's fallen in a construction accident. I'm driving a truck. Why did you point this out to me? If you'd have shown me one that said, beware of the intersection, I'd say, whoa, I'm getting a warning here. Yeah. And I put it out of my mind later that afternoon, parked that truck, got up there, fell two stories. I'm going to tell you something. You can tell me all the great lessons come from breaking your neck. That morning, if I'd known I was going to break my neck, I'd have called off. I would have opted out of all of those wonderful lessons, if you don't mind. Yeah. Yeah. What I'm telling you, you say, well, why did you do it? Because you can't know. Who would have known? Who would have known that somebody in this room, you pop up, you'll be doing fine, all of a sudden you've got a physical problem. The next thing you know, your life is absolutely altered, absolutely changed. Let me give you a book. If you like to read, get the book Unbroken unbroken. And it's about Louis Zapparini. Louis Zapparini was the man, he was an Italian runner, in, in, a Roman Catholic guy, uh, raised in Los Angeles. And he was a track star. And he was poised in 1940. In the 1940 Olympics, Louis Zapparini was, going, was destined to be the first human to break the four-minute mile. Everybody knew it. He was going to do it. I mean, he was doing it all the time in practice. And he was going to go to the 1940 Olympics, and he was going to break the, the, the Olympic record. He was going to be the first human to break the four-minute mile. I say, why didn't he do it? Because World War II came. There were no 1940 Olympics. And he ended up being a, being a uh, B, B-24 navigator, crashing into the Pacific, spent more time, I think, 45 days in a, in a, in a uh, uh, rubber raft with three guys. One of those guys died. I think maybe they all died. I'm trying to think of what I'm did. No, one of them lived. Two of them got there, and, and they're just 30 feet from an island where they'll, they'll be safe. Didn't they get picked up by a Japanese boat? Spent the rest of, his, rest of his time in a Japanese prison cell. And I can't tell you how horrible it was. You need to read the book. Who would have known? You see what I'm saying? Guys, I'm sorry. Sometimes life takes some turns. Here's this kid. This kid, he didn't do anything wrong. He's five years old. You can't blame his nurse. You say, well, she dropped him. Well, maybe she did drop him, but she saved his life. Yeah, that's right. Who would have known that he's going to spend the rest of his life a cripple? Who would have known that, you know, the marriage didn't work out? Who could have known? Who could have known that the great business that you dedicated to the Lord flopped? Doesn't, know, doesn't God know he was supposed to bless this because you were going to give him the glory? Who could have known what would happen? Look at uh, 2 Samuel chapter 9. Look at verse 1. And David said, 
Is there yet any left of the house of Saul that I may show kindness for Jonathan's sake? And there was the house of Saul, a servant whose name was Ziba. And when they had called him unto David, he said unto the king, uh, uh, the king said unto him, Art thou Ziba? And he said, Thy servant is he. And the king said, Is there not yet any of the house of Saul that I may show the kindness of God unto him? And Ziba said unto the king, Jonathan hath yet a son, which is lame on his feet. And the king said unto him, Where is he? And Ziba said unto the king, Behold, he's in the house of Micar, uh, Micar uh, the son of Abiel, or Amiel, uh, in Lodabar. Then king David sent and fetched him out of the house of, of Micar, the son of Amiel, from Lodabar. Now stop and think about it. Remember I'm telling you to stop and look at some of these verses? All right, somewhere along the line. Now years have gone by, have they not? And he realizes, okay, nobody's coming for me. I'm going to kind of... I'm going to kind of live a, a, a not too high profile life and it looks like I'm going to be just fine. Probably got himself a magic marker and a piece of cardboard and sat down at the interstate all day long. Yeah. And, and, you know, homeless, God bless, whatever. How do you think he reacted when somebody said, uh, I mean, some of the king's guards walked in yeah. and he's gone. Well, you can't run for the door when you're lame. Yeah. And you, they talk to somebody, and, and this is a real terror. You know what's really scary? When some cop talks to somebody and the guy points at you. <laughs> They're just something that's not good. Your day, your day is going to change. Okay? Not going to be the regular day. And so, he you know, he sees a, well, he must be after somebody. There must be a notorious criminal. Why is that guy pointing at me? And they walk over and they go, you Mephibosheth? Me? <laughs> I mean, what do you think he thought? He's finally going to do it. Yeah. David's finally going to kill me. Yeah? We're sent to come and get you. Why? We're just told to come and get you. But you don't have to worry. <laughs> You're right. Now when Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, verse 6, was come unto David, he fell on his face and did reverence. And David said, Mephibosheth. And he answered, Behold thy servant. He still don't know what's going to happen. And David said unto him, Fear not. He was afraid. He didn't know for sure David was not going to have him killed. Fear not. For I will surely show thee kindness for Jonathan thy father's sake. And will restore all, restore thee all the land of Saul thy father, and thou shalt eat bread at my table continually. Hey guys, who could have known he was going to get it all back? Who could have known? I mean, don't you think people came into loaded bar and they'd see this crippled guy, and somebody would go, "You know that guy is there." We used to have this guy in Auburn, New York, where I pastored. And he was, he was, uh, uh, he was kind of, uh, he was kind of spazzed out. He was kind of in another, you know, kind of like a Democrat. <laughs> and really, you'd see him walking down there, always had a suit and a tie, but he was not with us, okay? He was, I mean, his body was there, but his, his and he was always walking like this. And, and you know, I was new to the town, and, and I'm with one of my church guys. He says, see that guy right there? Yeah, he said, used to be a senator. Used to be a prominent politician here in town. And then his mind went. You think people in Lodabard and say, see that crippled guy right over there? Yeah, you know who that is? That's Saul's grandson. That is, that is Jonathan's son. I thought I heard he died. No, he didn't die. Man, they, they got him out when he was five years old. Look at him. Look at him. He can't even work a job. He's begging. Who could have known? Who could have known that this kid is never going to be hungry again? Yeah. Guys, he's not only getting the land back, he gets to eat at the king's table. Yes, no, who could have known? Who could have known that this, this homeless guy who is there no fault of his own, he did, hey, listen, five-year-olds, they, they don't do anything worthy of what this kid went through. And he didn't drop himself. He had none of this coming. 
Who could have known that one day somebody would take him out of a beautiful house and old David say, uh, can you take him out and say, uh, hey, Mephibosheth, you see this farmland out here? Yeah, that's just beautiful, David. Yeah, it's yours. Oh, no, 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 that's not mine. No, I don't have any land. <laughs> that was your dad's. That was going to be, that was going to be your, yours. And that's yours. You know that Zeba? Oh, yeah, I remember Zeba. Never really liked him. Well, he's your servant now. He's going to work that land for you. I got news for it. Zeba didn't like that part. Yeah. <laughs> That's the truth. Zeba finally was his own man, and all of a sudden David says, Hey, Zeba, go work the land for Mephibosheth. Yeah. Yes, my Lord. <laughs> he found a way around that one day. Yeah. You, what do you think when David said, Look at that house. That's a fine house. Mephibosheth says, How many pillars are holding up that? How, how many pillars are on the front? I don't know. Isn't that a beautiful place? Yeah, that's yours. Could we get a handicap ramp? <laughs> Who could have known that he'd be cared for by the king? From, yeah. from, from is what Brother Terrence said, from Lodabar. From the bad side of town. Yeah. From where the, the, the wrong side of the tracks. But who could have ever known, people that looked at him there, maybe begging along the wayside, who could have ever known this kid is going to get it all back? Man, they were going to cut his hair. They are going to shave his face. They are going to put good clothes on him. They were, and, and those guys were all to eat the house. But every night they'd come and get him and they'd take him to the king's house and he and David would fellowship over supper. Uh, who could have known that? Who could have known? Look at chapter 16. You know what I often wonder? What was it like when, when Mephibosheth pillowed his head on a clean pillow? What do you reckon that was like? Yeah, you think he even had a pillow before? What do you think it was like if, if maybe he got the very house he used to play hide and seek and, 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 and Israelites and Philistines with his buddies? Mm-hmm. I mean the halls that he used to run in, he's now living in. And somebody's taking care of him and he... He goes into the same bedroom he was in when he was a kid. There's a bed, clean sheets. Boy, I'll tell you something, guys. Can I tell you, mother, something? This is a sidebar. Can I tell you, mother, something? Your kids ought to know, they ought to, all your children, they ought to grow up with two smells. Two smells. Good food and clean. Man, I, I mean, I, I will never forget the smell of Murphy's oil soap and pine saw. My mom used to clean the ceilings of our house. My mom was clean. Well, I'll tell you, I mean, we'd pill our head on clean sheets. And you know, nothing, nothing blesses a boy more than walking home. And when he gets about three houses away, he smells good food. Oh, yeah. And it's coming from his house. There's nothing like, oh, man, oh, man, that's really, oh, that's, that's the neighbors. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, buddy, my mom was a good cook, and our, our house always smelled of good food all my life, all my life, and we weren't on the good side of town. I got to tell you the truth, we weren't on the good side of town. Pillowed my head every night on a clean pillow. My boys, the last 26 years that we've been on the road, I, I told you, you know, they spent their time, but I'd pick them up. We would, we would be in the van, and we'd pull into between two idling semis about 3 o'clock in the morning, and I'd scoop those sleeping boys up, and I'd carry them back to this little trailer, and every night, you know where they laid? You say, that's an awful thing. They laid their head on a clean pillow and clean sheets. What do you think? I'll bet you for a while the smell of clean was foreign to Mephibosheth's nose. I'll bet you he would lay down and he smelled what? Oh man, I remember that when I was a kid. Yeah. In this very bed. Yeah, I'll bet you, I'll bet you the people cleaned his house, I bet they always found packs of crackers in his nightstand. <laughs> well, I know I got all I could have, but you know, I just worry a little bit. <laughs> you just never know, you know. I'll just put a little away right here. So who could have known this? Look at chapter 16. And in chapter 16, Absalom is trying to kill his mentor, David. Absalom 
<clears throat> wants to kill him, wants to kill David. And look what happens. David is on the run and it says, when David was a little past the top of the hill, behold, Ziba, the servant of Mephibosheth, met him with a couple of asses saddled and upon them, 200 loaves of bread and a hundred bunches of raisins and a hundred uh, of a uh, hundred of summer fruits and a bottle of wine. And the king said unto Ziba, what meanest thou by these? And Ziba said, the asses be for the king's household to ride on and the bread and summer fruit for the young men to eat and the wine for such to be faint in the wilderness that, that such to be faint in the wilderness may drink. And the king said, where's our master's son? I mean, something's missing here. Where's that boy? Where's that cripple boy? And the king said, where's thy master's son? And Ziba said unto, unto the king, behold, he abideth in Jerusalem. For he said, today shall the house of Israel restore me the kingdom of my father. Then said, then said the king to Ziba, behold, thine, thine are all that pertain unto Mephibosheth. And Ziba said, I humbly beseech thee that I may find, gra- my, may find grace in thy sight, my Lord, O King. Who would have known when he finally got used to the clean sheets, when he got used to the good meals and fellowship with the King, who would have known somebody would have vilified him and slandered him? So how do you know he did? Listen, this kid got enough sense to know that Absalom is going to let him live. He ain't sticking around. Well, you think Absalom's going to say, Mephibosheth, I'm here to put you on the throne you belong on? Absalom would have killed him. In fact, all of those supplies are representative of what Mephibosheth was giving back to David. You know what he did? He said, this king has taken such good care of me. And now this king is in dire straits. And for the first time, who could have known that I'd ever be able to supply for him, but I'm going to do it for him. And he said, Ziba, get some food. Get it all out there. We're going to take this to David. And brother, he's watching Ziba and his sons and everything. He's saying, this is great. Well, I just can't wait. I, I just want to be, I just want to walk up. Maybe David's hungry. Maybe he's thirsty. Maybe he needs, he's tired of walking. We're going to take these jackasses up there for him to ride on. We're going to have this food for him. I can't wait for, <laughs> hey, Ziba, you forgot me. <laughs> Where's he going? They left. Who could have known? Who could have known that the very guy that was feeding him, David, would now think he was a traitor? Man, you talk about, I hate hate to say it, guys, you talk about life having uh, its ups and downs. Has this kid had not some ups and downs? What do you think he went through that day? Down again. Like how? Like David thinks I'm a traitor. I'm sure, I'm sure, listen, Ziba never did like working for me. I'll bet you he told David some kind of story. He certainly didn't say, Mephibosheth sent this to you. He'll be walking down the road any time now. I'll bet he's lying about me. Now David thinks I'm a traitor. And Absalom's probably going to send a hit squad to kill me. And suddenly, this life of peace is upside down. Can I ask you a question? You ever have your life turned like that? Yeah. Isn't it amazing, man? You can have a beautiful day like today. Like my friend. He wakes up, and tonight, he's without a wife. I mean, you wake up, and then a phone call comes. You ever have a phone call absolutely change your life? Did you ever have just, just, when you think everything is fine, all of a sudden it's not fine, and then you think it's all coming apart, and all of a sudden everything is doing good? But that is life, isn't it? And who could have known when he was in this palace and he is living here again, who could have known that somebody's going to slander him to the king and that he would find himself on the outs, not only with Absalom, but with David? Hey, the, he, he literally could have sat around going, I don't have a friend in the world. I don't have a friend. My servant has betrayed me. David, my provider, thinks that I'm a traitor. Absalom thinks I'm a threat. He's probably going to kill me. I don't have a friend in the world. Who would have known that somebody was going to have, take the first opportunity they had? Well, I'll tell you something, guys. It's when you're down that you'll find your enemies will stand up. Boy, the enemies, they'll, they'll, they'll murmur, they'll complain, but the first time they think you're down, they'll be on top of you just like jackals. They'll be there like hyenas. Man, as soon as they think you're weak, they'll be on you right now. 
And that is exactly what Ziba thought. Ziba thought, boy, this is my chance. I, I'm not like this kid. I was a free man. I wasn't a servant. And David, that stinking David makes me this kid servant again. I don't like doing this. I don't like working for this kid. But I know if I go to David, he'll take my head off. But all of a sudden, Ziba says, whoa, I think I can go to David today and work it out. He worked it out, didn't he? And who'd have known that this boy would be slandered and once again on the outside? Look at chapter 19. Chapter 19, David is coming home. Absalom is dead. Look what it says, verse 24. And Mephibosheth, the son of Saul, came down to meet the king. Now, here's how you know that he did not, he did not betray David and say they're going to establish, because from the day he left, he never took care of himself. He would neither dressed his feet, nor trimmed his beard, nor washed his clothes from the day the king departed until the day he came again in peace. He never took a bath. He never changed his clothes. He apparently had to have his feet always worked on. They were always some some open sore or something like that. He never took care of them. They're festering. He never trimmed his nails, never cut his hair, never trimmed his beard. But what else would convince David that this kid really, really was repentant, that he wasn't part of what Ziba said? And it came to pass when he was come to Jerusalem to meet the king, now look at this, the king said to him, Wherefore, when is not thou, thou with me, Mephibosheth? Hey, Mephibosheth, uh, your servant came. Where were you? My loyal friends came with me. Well, why weren't you there? And he answered, My lord, O king, my servant deceived me. For thy servant said, I will saddle me an ass, and I will, that I may ride thereon and go to the king, because thy servant is lame. And he hath slandered thy servant unto my lord the king. But my Lord, the king is like an angel of God. Do therefore whatsoever, uh, do therefore what is good in thine eyes. For all of my father's house are but dead men before my Lord, the king. Yet didst thou set thy servant among them that did eat at thine own table. What right therefore have I yet to cry any more unto the king? Look what it says. And the king said unto him, why speakest thou any more of the matter? I have said, thou and Ziba divide the land. I knew what he said. He said Ziba could have it. Ziba just lost some of his, lost the land. You say, well, he got to have half of it. Yeah, but who could have known that he's going to get reestablished again? <laughs> you know what I think? I don't think that land meant anything. You know what I think? I think getting that relationship with David reestablished is what made so much to him. He said, you have been so kind to me. Listen, you should have killed me. That's what you were supposed to do. Don't you know how the script is written? You are supposed to kill me and you never killed me. That would have been enough, but no, no. You know what you did? You you reestablished me and you gave me my father's plantation and you gave me the land and the place to live, but you let me sit at your table and I am supposed to complain? Can I, can I give you a thought? What on earth does some of you people gripe about when God has been so good? Amen. We all talk, you know, you hear us talking all the time about the, 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 the downfall of our country. I hate to see it. Can I tell you? If it goes down tonight, can I tell you something? Sure been a good ride. Yep. Oh, yeah. Amen. Right. Guys, if you go home and you turn on your TV and you find out whatever happened, happened. And our country's gone, and so has yours. And it falls, Canada falls into despair and anarchy. The United States falls into despair and anarchy. We've sure had a lot of stakes, ain't we? I mean, we have had some serious stakes, have we not? And fried chicken. (laughs) Man, I'm telling you, God's been good, hasn't he? You know, here's what I'm telling you. If God never blesses us again, it has been good, hasn't it? And here was, here was this crippled boy, and he had a legitimate complaint. My servant slandered me. 
he told you a lie. But, and he said that, but he said, oh, king, you don't owe me nothing. You never did owe me anything. Yeah. And all you've ever been is nice to me. Yes, amen. That's right. Amen. I got nothing coming. Who could have ever known that he would be reestablished? But the most amazing is not verse 29. It's verse 30. And Mephibosheth said unto the king, Yea, let him take all, for as much as my lord the king has come again in peace unto his own house. This is the most amazing thing of all. Who could have known that he'd never get bitter? He never got bitter. I've, I've studied this thing over the years. I look at people. I've talked with people for, for, for decades. I, maybe there's three. I know of only two. I can only think of two things that make people bitter. You know what it is? Just boiled down real simple. Getting bad that you don't deserve or not getting good that you do deserve. Yeah. Some of you guys, you got a job and because you're the Christian, your boss passes you over, promotes somebody else, and after that, you start stealing the pencils from work. You start not working all of the hours that you turn in. You start cheating the place. You say, wow, well, you know what? They list that guy they, they hired. They, they, put his, they put his nephew in there. His nephew, he worked for the company for two weeks, and he doesn't even know how to get out of a phone booth and can't remember the number for 911 to call for help. Everybody knew I should have had that job. They never gave, they passed me over because he didn't like my Christian testimony. I wouldn't drink at the office party. And suddenly, and now look, you got a legitimate complaint. You didn't get the good that you had coming. But don't let that get you bitter. Right. That's right, amen. Or you ever have bad happen that you didn't have coming? This kid qualified on both fronts. That's right. He didn't get good that he legitimately had coming like the throne but he got bad that he didn't have coming. He didn't deserve to break his legs. He didn't deserve to be a cripple. He didn't deserve to have somebody lie about him. Man, if anybody could have been bitter, if anybody could have been angry, this is the guy. Again, man, I'm sorry. You young people are so assaulted. I'm not, I'm not railing on you. I'm telling you, I'm not railing on you because, because it is not your fault. But you know what is amazing? This is one of the most amazing things. This generation, do you know what the most outstanding characteristic characteristic is, they're bitter. I'm, and I heard that. And I see it in them. They're bitter. And I thought, for what? You know why? Because from this old, they've all been told they're champions. They've all been told they're going to get something. They've all been told they should have everything. They've all been told that everything is for them. It's all about them. And life is going to be wonderful. And you don't have to worry about a thing. And you're just going to make it. And then they get into life. And they're flipping. Hey, hey, hey. I see them in my country. You know where I see these teenage kids? They're on the corner with the sign that says, tax prepare here. And they're, you know, spinning it. That's what they do. And you know what I thought when I saw those guys? Well, is, don't you train in your youth for what you're going to do all your life? I can see this guy 10 years from now with a piece of cardboard with a magic marker that says homeless gone. It's the only on-job training he's ever had. He's going to hold a sign all of his life. Yeah. And they, you know what's happened? They told you you deserve something. Well, you do. Hell. Yeah. But beyond that, you don't deserve anything. And I'm not, ra- I'm not railing. I'm trying to get you to think about that because the more you think you've got something good coming, the more bitter you're going to be. But none of us have had what this kid had. I don't care if you've got a physical problem. None of us are royalty that have been cheated out of our throne. Because all the way through this story, no matter what you say, you know what he could have done every night of his life, even after he was reestablished with David? You know what he could have done? He could have pillowed his head on the new clean sheets with a full stomach. Just before he went off to sleep, he could have said, but I should be king. Right? Yep, yeah. He never did. So how do you know? He wasn't bitter. Yeah. He didn't get the good that he did have coming. Yeah. And he got a whole lot of bad that he didn't have coming. Yeah. 
And how did he end the whole thing? Oh, David, give, give Ziba all of it. I don't even care just to see you again, just to know you're okay. My goodness, what? Boy, you can sure tell he was his daddy's son. That, that is a son of Jonathan. You could tell he got that from his dad. He didn't get that from his granddad. He took after his dad. But isn't that something? And you know what I think? When I read this, I think of Jonah. The missionary to Nineveh didn't want to go. You know the whole story. He went. He's out there and, and he smacks God in the face. You know how he smacked God in the face? It says he built a booth and he's, look, he's watching Nineveh. You know what he was saying? He wanted to see what was going to happen. He's going to, he was saying to God, well, if you ain't God enough to take care of it, I'll see if a real God come by and destroy this city. You know what God did? Gave him a gourd so he'd be in the shadow. Did he say thanks? No. You know what he said? I do well to be angry till I die. Brother, that's a way to go, isn't it? I, 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 he said, you're going to be angry all the time. I do anger to be, do, I, I do well to be angry till I die. This is the only guy I ever found was mad because he was a success. The world's shortest sermon, yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Eight words. You will never get that from me. Just don't get your hopes up. And the entire city gets right with God. How's that? Brother, can you imagine? Uh, how things go up in Porters of Prairie? Oh, rotten, man. I got eight words into my sermon and the whole stinking city got right with God. I hate it. <laughs> I want them to all die and go to hell. I mean, this is, yeah, really. It's like being the missionary to San Francisco. And they went and got right. What a dirty trick. <laughs> and he's mad. He wanted to see him judged. And he's mad at God. Oh, uh, look. Jonah's problems were, were made, he made his own problems. Mephibosheth was a victim of circumstances. You can't find one thing Mephibosheth ever did that, he, that, that, he, that you could say, that's why that happened. He's five years old. He didn't kill his dad. He didn't kill his granddad. He didn't break his legs intentionally. He wasn't gonna. He wasn't gonna uh, uh, betray David and think that boy. Now I'm gonna be king. That's what his servant said. You know that wasn't it. He never had any of it coming. I think he's probably purer than some of some of us. You know that. You know what I ask you? That's the last statement right there. That's the last words we get from Mephibosheth. The last words we get from Mephibosheth are all oh, David. Just to see you, I'm, I'm fine, man. It's all good. The last words of Jonah, I do well to be angry till I die. Can I ask you a question? What's your last words going to be? Now, these young people, this is out of your league because believe me, you're way far from your last words. You are, your, your last words are distant. And that's good. That's good. You've got a whole life ahead of you. But some of you, some of you adults, and maybe some of you teens, maybe you need to get it all squared away now because if you get rid of the bitterness now, you can get through life. You'll do better getting through life. Well, you just don't know what my family life was like. Not only do I not know, I don't even care because I'm just filled with compassion from Jesus. I mean, if you don't mind, I'll listen, I'll listen to Brother Lowen's family play the violin. I don't want to hear your solo. You don't want to hear mine. Okay? That's the truth. I, I, you know, I was this meeting, and this woman, you know, I shake hands when people leave, and I shake this woman's hand. My line, my line is, how are you doing? I see people, I say, how are you doing? And I ask this woman, I say, how are you doing? Oh, that was an open door. <laughs> Boy, listen, when they start with their baby second dirty diaper and go from there, you are here for the long haul. I mean, could somebody bring me a sandwich? I'm getting weak from loss of food. And you know what happens? The very next night, I'm standing at the same door. The same woman walks up and I go, how are you doing? I went, oh, why did I ask you? You're going to tell me. And tell me, and tell me, and tell me. Guys, nobody wants to hear a complainer. I could show you 
uh, a pastor's wife, her husband went out on her, did her wrong, abandoned her, and left her and married another woman. You say, she was done wrong. Absolutely, she got bad she she did not have coming. And you couldn't stand to be around her. Because every time, I mean, it's, it's been 15 years, and every time you see her, she rehashes that thing, and the next time she rehashes that again. You know, the first time you hear the story, you listen because you feel bad. This is too bad. The next time, you're going, boy, this really hurt her. After about the fourth time, you go, you know what happens? You see her coming, and you avoid her. Yeah. You say, oh, you don't care? You get tired of hearing the story. Right. Yeah. Wait a minute. I'm telling you, she was right. But you know what happened? She got bitter. She got bad she did not deserve. And she let it get her bitter. Okay, so what do I do? I'll just give you a bad word, a terrible word, a horrible word. Forgive. You're going to have to forgive. So who am I going to forgive? Whoever you're mad at. Who did you wrong? Who legitimately did you wrong? See, I didn't say, if you're bitter, I didn't say that you're wrong in, in your complaint. I'm not saying you're wrong in saying I had good coming and didn't get it. I agree with you. You're probably right. I didn't say you're wrong in saying bad came to me that I didn't have coming. I Okay. But you're going to have to forgive whoever's in control. And you know who you might have to forgive? You might have to forgive God. You mean God was wrong? No. Well, God's never wrong. But he does do things we really don't want him to do. And sometimes you've got to forgive him. Sometimes you've got to forgive his plan for your life. That his plan takes you through a briar patch. It takes you past a coffin. It takes you through a hospital bed. It takes you through low to bar or the belly of a whale. I mean, guys, the journey is not always as we would have it. Isn't that true? And I'll bet you I'm talking to more than one person in here. You'll never admit this because you don't like to frame these words in your mind. But I'm talking to more than one person in here. Your bitterness is really anger at God. You'll talk about the person that wronged you, but, but bottom line, you know what it is? God did not take care of me. Well, then all I can tell you is be angry till you die or forgive him. Because you know when you forgive him, you'll have fellowship with the king again. Brother, you'll you'll have fellowship with the king, and that is really good. I'd like you to stand with your heads bowed.